So I'm thrilled to have the uh, team behind the Alpaca Large Language Model from Stanford AI here today. Jan Dubois, Rohan Tauri, Chen Li, and uh, Tian Ye Zhang. Sorry. Uh, and we had a couple of surprise special guests. So thrilled to have really the entire team here. Um, yeah, all right. There are the Alpaca fans. Here we go. Uh, so if you're here in the audience, I think it's a fair guess that you pay some attention to AI Twitter. And you may have noticed uh, that moment in the past couple of months when the mood flipped from uh, open AI will rule us all to something more like uh, open models are inevitable. And I think that Alpaca was a major catalyst behind that change. Uh, suddenly we had an open model, a small model that felt like ChatGPT. Not the same level of performance, but that gap was a lot smaller than I think many people realized at the time. So uh, I'd like to just dig directly into Alpaca. Um, I'd like to start by defining some basic terminology. Um, Alpaca is an instruction following large language model trained from Meta's Llama model. And that instruction following bit is really important. So why don't we start there? Um, Rohan, maybe you can tell us what does instruction following mean? Yeah, so I think, you know, instruction following is sort of, it's not really well defined. It covers like a really broad variety of use cases and it's actually sort of what makes ChatGPT feel a little bit like magic. It's sort of like your AI assistant. Whatever you ask it, it responds to you and sort of tries to help answer whatever question you want. So these are things that can be really general. So like, you know, Maybe you want to ask, like, what are some of the great, what are the, some of the causes of the Great Depression? Uh, you're, you're a student, you're studying, you can ask that. Or you want to, like, figure out how do I write some code to, like, execute the SQL query if my database has this specific schema. So these are, yeah, it's just, like, it covers a large variety of different questions that you can ask. Something that you, you might want to search on the internet, but, you know, sometimes it can be hard to find through different links and stuff. Um, so, yeah, it just really covers, like, a broad variety of uh, questions that you might want an AI system to, to answer. So the, the key process here was fine tuning. How does fine tuning actually provide instruction following? Yeah, so, so the key process for Alpaca really was um, giving it examples of these demonstrations of, of, of uh, questions and responses. So this is really different from when you pre-train a language model, for example, Llama. Um, this is just sort of trained on all the text on the internet, which really doesn't come in this like question answer format. Uh, so what we did for Alpaca really was to give it examples of like, you, are an, you should become an AI assistant and like respond in this format. Here's the question, you should give an answer that like answers the question. Um, so yeah, for, that, that's exactly what the supervised fine tuning instruction tuning process of Alpaca was. Um, and one of the clever tricks behind Alpaca was um, that you know, previous work had also been done, had also done before, which is like to get this demonstration of questions and answers, you don't actually need to go through humans and have humans write all these uh, demonstrations. You can query existing, like, existing language models. So for example, we queried uh, DaVinci 003 uh, to automatically generate, here's the question, here's the response, and then feed this to, uh, to Llama. So why do this? What's the sort of driving research question here? Obviously, Meta released Llama, then what sort of what made you guys come together and build this system? Yeah, so I think broadly speaking, like before Alpaca and this latest slew of models came out, it was really unclear what the recipe was in order to get a good instruction following model, something that felt like ChatGPT. You know, there's a lot of talk about you need 175 billion parameters. OpenAI has a huge, you know, they invested a lot in data collections. How, do you need all that data to get a good quality model? Do you need this RLHF stuff that they were doing on top? Um, these were all like mysteries and we didn't really have any of the answers to these questions. We still don't have the full set of answers, but um, Alpaca is, you know, it's a small model, it's 7 billion parameters, which is still a lot of parameters, but much smaller than 175B. Um, the data we used is sort of like very little manual filtering we did. We just kind of created an API for it. So that kind of reduced that bottleneck. And there was no RLHF. It was just pure supervised learning uh, on top. So that, that kind of resolved a lot of the mysteries around these questions. And so... Yeah, I think that that sort of really significantly changed the landscape of how, of how people even view what is possible to, to be able to do, to do an open source. 
So one of the key things you mentioned here was the trick sort of using existing models to be able to build a nice QA data set. Why were existing data sets not good enough? Why make that decision that we need to build our own and then use tricks to actually do that? Yeah, I'll take that. I think maybe link back to the earlier question of what is the instruction following and we can put it in better historical context. What we have been doing in the past, say, five to 10 years in natural language processing is that we have specialized models. Let's say, you know, we're gonna build a sentiment classifier or I'm gonna build a name recognizer. And when, when I deploy a system, I'm gonna chain together many of these uh, specialized modules. Um, they work to some extent, but what really changed with instruction following is that you have a single model that can hold, handle all the general tasks. It can chat, it can do classification, it can recognize topics whatsoever. Now, the problem is many of the resources we have in academia is naturally built with this previous era of mindset. We have specific data set that were you know, in the order of tens of thousands or even millions for a single specific task. But the problem is when we try to adapt large language models for general instruction following and we try to benchmark them on, on these tasks, we realize uh, they don't really generalize that well. For a given task, you're really specializing to a specific format that is not great for instruction, sorry, for, inter for interactions. So the key of what we are doing here is say, you know, let's just really follow what OpenAI did, right? Try to fine tune on the kind of distribution, the kind of data that people will actually interact with the model with. Um, yeah, and I think that's the key major point of why we're generating these, these uh, you know, using the language model to generate these tasks is to approximate realistic uh, usage of these systems instead of relying on uh, data sets that are you know, built for specialized tasks. So as I mentioned, you guys hit publish on this work. It sort of lit AI Twitter on fire. Uh, people lost their minds a bit. Many tweets were sent. Uh, before you hit publish, <laughs> what did you feel like you'd learned? Like, what were your takeaways from the results that you were getting out of this? So I think there's really three things. Uh, Rohan mentioned it very briefly. But the first thing is that you don't need a model that is that big. People had in mind 175 billion. That was the number everyone said. That was 7 billion for, for this alpaca. Second thing is people thought that you needed a lot of data, because at least in machine learning, that's what we're used to. You need a lot of data. That was 50,000 examples. 50,000, we actually, we never released, and we released that model two days ago, but we had a model that was only trained with 10,000 and was just as good. So it's really, it lowers the bar of what anyone can build on their vertical or their type of task. That was the second thing. The third thing is this RLHF. So if you think about uh, how ChatGPT was trained, they had this supervised fine tuning step, but they also had this step which was learning from pairwise preferences. When the first instruction GPT came out, people thought that it was trained with this RLHF pipeline, because that's essentially what OpenAI kind of suggested, or at least we thought because that's how the, that's the papers that they published. And then we people learned that it was actually not trained with this pairwise feedback. So as a community, we didn't know, do you need this pairwise feedback or not? And I think what Alpaca kind of showed is that you could go really far without this pairwise feedback. And then the no next project, which we probably might talk a little bit about later, is actually adding this pairwise feedback and learning from that. Yeah, for sure. You mentioned the 7 billion parameter model. Was that arbitrary? <laughs> Were you worried that it was too small to get good performance? So we, I think we wanted so usually people like to do big models yeah. because it sounds good, it's good for PR. But really what is important is inference time. That's where like most of the time is spent, like that's, that's the cost is inference. So what we wanted is to see how low can we go. Also we are academics, so we don't have that much compute. It's like how, how low can we go? And, uh, and that will just improve development. So we wanted to, to see, I think the numbers that we had in mind before that was around 20 billion, I think at least as the number I had in mind. And uh, we were somewhat surprised that 7B worked, but like why go higher if that was good enough? Yeah, I was thinking that your compute budget for fine tuning Alpaca was probably uh, less than our drinks budget for this event. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty fun. Definitely, yeah, you guys have good drinks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of Alpaca fans, like I was saying. 
Um, so I think uh, Llama and particularly Alpaca really sort of opened the floodgates for an entire ecosystem now of open instruction following models. Do you guys follow that ecosystem? Are there any developments in that uh, over the past couple of months that you think are worth highlighting? Um, probably I can chime in a little bit for it. So I think all of us have been like following the literature quite closely mm -hmm. and there are many follow-ups. Um, um, and I can categorize that by, you know, two different broad categories. So one is that people have been, you know, taking this idea into multi multimodal, uh, the multimodal space where, you know, not only do you have like text uh, as input output, but you also have images. And, you know, there's some, um, uh, extent, extension of the work or like some uh, replication of GPT-4 in the sense that people have, you know, really tried using this idea to get models to actually take also images and be able to answer questions based on those images. So that's one line. So the other line really has focused on, you know, how do you improve, um, let's say, the performance of these models and how do you understand, like, how do you improve our understanding of, you know, what is the right quality of data and quantity of data? Um, and some of the works on this, um, you know, I think a paper that came out two days ago is like QLORA, where people have been, you know, using these lightweight um, low rank adapters to fine tune models. And they also have some analysis about whether, you know, quality or quantity of data is more important. So, you know, they're basically a vibrant community that has um, really, um, you know, um, rise from this. Um, I would say sort of like a revolution, and it's, it's been quite amazing to see all the progress. Anyone else have something that stands out there? Well, I, I guess I personally really liked this new work from uh, Facebook AI research, uh, Lima. They show that you, know, you can really fine tune with 1,000 uh, example and you know, get even better capability than, than Alpaca. Um, yeah, I, th I'm, I think overall this opens up a lot of new questions. Uh, and research, you know, how do we actually think of the instruction following process? You know, what is fine tuning really doing? Uh, really interesting hypothesis, I think they propose, and many of us have shared in the past, is uh, what, I think what it calls superficial alignment. Basically, you're really teaching a language model about this question and answering format, right? Instead of teaching any new knowledge. Um, but at the same time, we see that you, know, you can train with very little data. On the other hand, we see that when you train with more data, it's actually difficult to improve model performance. I think you already mentioned that you know, when we see, you, know, you take a 10K alpaca data and you expand that to 52K, we really don't see much. And that's surprising, which right? is counterintuitive to most of our uh, machine learning wisdom. Um, so yeah, I think you know, in general, there's a lot of research questions to, to, to be answered here. I think you all mentioned this uncertainty around what are the ingredients you need in these post-training steps, RLHF, reinforcement learning with human feedback. And I think often instruction tuning and RLHF gets sort of conflated. Uh, does someone want to define like what is RLHF and how is it distinct from instruction tuning, supervised fine tuning? I'm happy to do that. So basically there are really two steps or three steps. The first step is a pre-training phase. Pre-training phase, that's essentially LAMA. That's what people call large, like basically um, language modeling, which is predicting the next word. Then there's a second step, which is taking this large language model and giving it question answers that humans think are the type of question answers that they would care about. So these are the questions that we care about. These are the answers that we care about. So OpenAI basically pays experts to get the type of question answers that you want. And this is a supervised fine tuning step. Then there's a the third step which is this learning from pairwise preferences, which is you take the supervised learning model and you ask it to output two answers for one question, and you ask a human which answer is better. And then how you optimize this is using reinforcement learning. So we can go a little bit uh, on that later, but basically it's just a way to maximize the number of times that human will say, I preferred your output. Um, yeah, so these are really the, the three steps. And I think the third step, the, the, the mindset that people had is that it is oftentimes easier to say what you prefer than really saying that's the output I would have liked and writing it down. Humans are really good at saying this is not good. They are less good at saying that's exactly what I would have wanted. So that at least that's the, that's the idea that, that is behind, I think, this RHF pipeline. Got it, yeah. 
yeah, whenever I use ChatGPT and I do the thumbs up or thumbs down, and then it asks me, what would you have put here? That's <laughs> freeze up. What am I supposed to say? I don't know. I was asking for a reason. Also, it takes time. Yeah, we don't have time. Right. <laughs> so people are willing to give feedback, but not to spend the time to give that feedback. Um, so the way I think about sort of the landscape today is that RLHF, basically anything beyond supervised fine tuning is the real unknown in terms of what ingredients are being put into proprietary models. Um, do you agree with that characterization? Maybe you can elaborate on how little we know about how some of these proprietary models are actually trained. Yeah, so we have a, actually a project that we just released a couple of days ago called Alpaca Farm, which basically builds on Alpaca and adds this second, this third step that Jan mentioned of uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback. Um, and one of the key things there was like, well, you know, there's this procedure you can do of like, you take multiple model outputs, you get the human preferences, and then you optimize against it. But the biggest question there is like, what, how exactly do you optimize against it? Like reinforcement learning, specifically the method that most people use, PPO, is just one way to do this. There are multiple ways that you can th think about doing this. Um, and so that's exactly the, the research question that we set out to answer. And so we benchmarked a bunch of methods. Um, and you know, at least in our limited setting that, that we did study, we found that actually, well, you know, in this case, PPO really was the best. And it did provide uh, so, some gains uh, um, you know, on top of like, just the normal alpaca-based model. Um, but I think definitely there's a lot more research questions still uh, around there, like, you know, specifically like, around exactly how do you even collect, what's the best way to collect the human feedback? Um, kind of the most common way is you present two, two answers and then ask the human which one do you prefer. But uh, you can, you know, maybe you want to go with the Likert, like a absolute scale, like on a scale of one to 10, how good is this response? Or maybe you want to rank four different responses. Like all these are open design questions that uh, we still need to explore and there's a lot of mystery around these. Yeah, maybe you can elaborate on Alpaca Farm. So why is it an Alpaca Farm, <laughs> for example? Yeah. So I think to, well, our design choice here is really to provide a framework for people to build on things. I mean, Alpaca is great, uh, it's a good model, but in this crazy world, of course, in two weeks, there will be a better model. Um, what we wanna do is to enable people to play and do research on RLHF, on learning from human feedback in general. So what we built is a simulation framework. In this framework, all of the part you're gonna use human, which is expensive and slow, all the part you're gonna use human for, you can do it with uh, querying GPT-4 or other like chat GPT. We build this framework so that, you know, in this simulation environment, if you study and learn something new, hopefully it would transfer to whatever you're gonna be doing with the human data. Uh, for, as a first step, we show that, you know, we benchmark several learning from feedback methods, and we show that indeed RL is still currently the best performing model, I think. But now, you know, we release this framework and you can tweak and modify each part of this. We hope that in the future soon, you know, we can have a simpler methods where it's easier to run methods that replace our uh, reinforcement learning. Or at least we can better understand what is going on with reinforcement learning. Because this is a, although I, mean, I guess we didn't really introduce it, it's a long and complicated process. Yeah. I think one of the things I thought was most amusing about Alpaca Farm is one of the important steps is you add randomness to the responses to make them worse so that they would then be more like what you get from human annotators. Uh, I, we're, I noticed there are a number of sort of tricks where it's not as much how do we get good feedback to the model, but also how do we get human-like feedback to the model? Yeah, I think there's really, there's two worlds you could live in. Either you believe that you're in the world where you want to learn from OpenAI or from other models to build a better model, which arguably might be what we have done with Alpaca. But then there's a second world, which is, we want to give a simulator such that everyone can develop their own methods. And if you build a simulator, what you're going to end up doing at, at after simulation is actually still developing with humans and actually learning from humans. And if you really want to simulate it as faithful to humans, you need to have the same randomness that humans have. So humans, if you ask two humans what they prefer, they actually have very low agreement about what is better. So we found that uh, if you look at a single human and you look at the uh, majority preference of other humans, the agreement is around 66%, which is very low. Um, but if you ask GPT-4 and agreement with itself, it's huge. 
because it's essentially, I mean, depending on how you sample from it, it's essentially deterministic or, or close to it. So that's one part of the variance is that humans disagree with each other. But it's also, also another part of the variance, which is that humans, if you ask them today or tomorrow, it's gonna be different. There's also noise in the process. So one thing which we had to do because we were in this, in this world of simulation is really try to simulate the disagreement between humans and simulate the disagreement of a single human. So we added noise, as you said, but we also added multiple annotators from different models with different prompts. So we have a pool of 15 simulated annotators to replicate what uh, 15 human annotators would give. Um, so we were actually pretty surprised about that because that, that's not something which we actually thought initially. We thought it's better if it's no randomness, but the tra training dynamics actually really depend on the randomness. Um, so even though you can build a better model without the randomness, if you want to simulate humans, you need it. Yeah, that makes sense. I think the other thing that you alluded to that's surprising about the Apaca Farm results is that you need even less supervised fine-tuning input than you used when you actually fine-tuned alpaca, um, which also surprises me because my intuition around reinforcement learning is one of the reasons you apply it is in domains where you can't get sort of nice, clean, supervised pairs uh, to provide to some sort of training process. So clearly, RLHF is doing something qualitatively different uh, do you have any intuition about what's going on? Like how do you distinguish supervised fine tuning from RLHF in terms of what it's providing to the model? Yeah, so I think, uh, I think it's, it's a very fascinating question. Um, exactly as you said. So like one of the things like, you know, in this, we were developing, for example, a pocket in the simulator. You saw that, you know, 52,000 was better than 10,000 in the simulator. So that's, that's what we ended up sharing with everyone. And then later we did the human study and, you know, the humans actually prefer the 10,000 one. So that was, that was quite a surprise for sure. Um, one of the things there is that, uh, you know, we really feel that the type of instruction and output distribution, the type of examples, like how noisy they are and how, like what's the quality of them really matters. So one of the things is like for the Apaca data set, you know, we prompted DaVinci 003 for it. And, you know, depending on how we prompted them, we didn't have that many seed tests to begin with. It's possible that with much higher quality examples, the data scaling is much more favorable. Um, so that you can keep increasing the number of data points and still, still getting better performance. So this is not something that we explored. Um, and it's definitely a limitation. Um, but I think your broader point, which is definitely true, is that in, the, in, the, in cases where it's kind of hard to get the supervised demonstration data, um, you know, RLHF and getting these pairwise preferences is, is a way to increase your model performance. And that's exactly what we see in Alpaca Farm. And some of the qualitative stuff that we really see is like one of the major ones is like um, length and how much information uh, the model gives. So Alpaca responses, you know, the, one, the base Alpaca model that we shared it tends to be quite short. Uh, it doesn't give you, if you've played with chat GPT, it's actually kind of long and lengthy and keeps going on and on and on. And once we applied the RLHF process to Alpaca, that's kind of exactly what we saw, um, is that the responses were much longer, it added a lot more detail. And um, you know, a lot of times this can, this can kind of work against you because the model will sometimes add detail that is incorrect or just hallucinate stuff. So there is still more research to be done there about what the right trade-offs are. But in, in that sense of like, you know, there was a, it made the model a little bit better because the humans preferred it uh, and because we, we like the responses better. Um, I think, you know, you know RLHF was de definitely able to qualitatively change the model in a way that supervised fine tuning just wasn't able to. Yeah. Maybe to chime in more on the high level side, I think John Schulman from OpenAI recently gave this really fascinating talk on how uh, RLHF could be different from uh, supervised fine tuning and, uh, well, you should all go watch that talk, but you know, the, the bit that I found really interesting is there's this age old problem of uh, supervised fine tuning, right? If you think about it, every time what you're learning is conditioning on all the correct behavior, what should I do next? But when the model is being deployed in the wild, it relies on your own trajectory, right? Like you are, you're generating the next word condition on the, the stuff you have just said. This could lead to a, a mismatch between training and inference. Um, whereas in RL, you, you don't really have this problem. You know, you generate all the samples from your own model and you get a reward. You try to understand, okay, which part of my output is correct, which is what it is not. You know, it could teach model you know, how to handle, you, you know, like being independent on its own better. Um, yeah, I'll just say that. I mean, there, this, is a, this is a fascinating talk, so <laughs> yeah. 
Um, well, I think before we open up to questions from the audience, I'd like to just zoom out a little bit. Um, there are, I'm sure, some members here who are training their own models or interested in training their own models. Uh, is there any sort of hard-won experience you can share or advice you can give? Um, I don't mean what aspects, maybe. <laughs> you, you use alpaca farm, maybe. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a, a few things. Um, you know, typically when we talk about just fine-tuning the models, like, you know, talking about the whole model development pipeline, the fine-tuning part is actually quite cheap, I think. Um, like, training the base model takes a lot of compute, and once you've got a model, uh, serving it to your customers or whatever application you're building, that takes a lot of compute, uh, compute the inference. Um, the fine-tuning stage is really very, very, like, you know, for Alpaca, it was less than $100 on, on, um, on commodity compute. So it, the fine-tuning stage is not really the bottleneck at this point, uh, I feel. Um, yeah, you can scale to larger models as well, but then you get into like the inference cost of the on was saying. That's really like, you know, if you're thinking about deploying these models, like really the limiting factor you should be considering at this point is uh, just sort of inference and how you can set up a scalable solution for that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, th I think evaluation is a hard and open problem. Like, um, it's very difficult to simulate what people, you know, how people interact with ChatGPT. Uh, think of you're gonna you know use ChatGPT in your programming day job, and there you will encounter a lot of corner cases because you're trying to solve real problems, and real problems are always messy. Whereas you know if you try to have someone annotate uh, evaluation side, you give them a blank paper and say you know come up with interesting question that will be good to test a language model for. You end up, you end up with those generic boring examples like you know how do I sort this list? How do I generate Fibonacci number? Uh, I think to approximate these like, long tail real life behavior is, is, is super hard. And um, yeah, but I think that's also where the interesting bit lies. Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, that's a, maybe a good segue. Um, you've all done research outside of Alpaca. You've all sort of have research interests that are even potentially beyond LLMs. Um, maybe I can hear from each one of you, sort of, what do you see as the big questions in AI research right now? What's driving you? What's motivating you? Uh, maybe we can go from Jan down to um, Chen. Yeah, so actually, until five months ago, I wasn't working on natural language processing at all. I was more on the self-supervised learning, learning representations. And there, the thing is, I was really excited because with representations, you could train one big model. And then you basically have representation, and then you train a simple model from it. But what I realized with, I think, ChatGPT um, is that really you don't even need the second step of training a simple model afterwards. It's really you can interact directly with ChatGPT and you can ask it whatever you want. So that's, that's really what made my mind uh, switch. Um, and now in terms of research, I think the evaluation thing that Chenny just said for me is a big point is how do you evaluate it? Because I think in academia, we're very used to having fixed benchmarks, and I don't think that works for instruction uh, following. And just generally, we'll, as AI really gets deployed in the world, we'll have to move away from this. And if you think, for example, about the fact that ChatGPT now uses tools, like we have to evaluate that. Because language model, like worst case, it says something bad. It's not great, but it's not a huge impact. But once it can really interact with robots. So once they can really have this type of interaction, I think evaluating is extremely important and knowing when it will fail, because the risk, if it does fail, is actually much bigger than if you just interact with a, with a language model. So that's something I'm pretty excited about. Yeah, learning from Pairwise preferences. I wish the robot had not crashed. <laughs> that's a problem. Exactly. Rohan, how about you? Yeah, so um, I think, so for me, I, I come from a, a more vision background uh, as well. And uh, one of the big uh, kind of turning points about you know, how all these text interfaces could be really useful was the release of the clip model, which kind of provide this like shared grounding for images and natural language. And this really provided you know, a lot of people in the vision community and people building vision applications a new interface. Like you know, searching over text with images was not something that was like really accessible before. And that kind of, uh, having that interface was really important and brought a lot of applications to light. And so now we've kind of gone to the full circle. Now, now I'm sort of like, you know, focusing purely on this text interface. And like the sort of the natural question to me is like, hey, like, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm stuck in the ChatGPT terminal or the website. I'm like, I just want you to sh show you what I'm building. And like, can you just, you know, like, 
can you just see my screen, you know? Or like, can I just show you this video? And so I think a lot of these like multimodal interactions, new forms of interaction than just talking through it through text, through text uh, will be really important. So I'm really excited about, you know, fusing new forms of like multimodality, you know, this is like images and videos into these models so that they can jointly reason over like all these sort of like data streams that we can provide to it that exist already like plentifully in the real world. So uh, that's something that I'm, I'm super excited about and looking forward to uh, in the future. Um, cool. Um, yeah, so I, I have like a wide span of research interest and in, um, but I, I think, you know, building sort of on top of this alpaca discussion, I, th I think one thing that um, I learned or, you know, I, I think we as a group sort of learned is that, you know, data collection is like a big part uh, of your machine learning pipeline. So uh, I'm, you know, tr more or less, you know, a methods researcher in the sense that I, I love to develop new methods for machine learning. Um, and that sort of workflow was usually, you know, you start with a fixed data set and then you iterate your, your methods to build models and you test out your models. Mm -hmm. But I recently started to realize that, you know, the data collection aspect, um, the data collection pipeline is actually um, very important and it can get very complex. Um, so one of the interesting things I've been just recently thinking about is just data collection in an efficient way and, you know, quality control, things related to this and how can we sort of, you know, improve or make this um, cheap and, you know, motivate people to come up with ways of contributing data. Yeah. Cool. I guess uh, unlike Yan and Rohan, I've been working on this for a bit. And uh, I was joking, you know, I used to work on text generation before they become large language model these days. The long and hard problem that is not going away is guarantee and factuality. With these uh, language models, we never obtained any real guarantee, right? We couldn't say, you know, this language model won't make a mistake when it's doing this, right? And we're deploying these system into more and more, you know, real life places. You, one day you're going to ask, you know, your bank account, how much money do I have? You never wanted to lie, right? I mean, even one percent of risk or 0.1 percent of risk is not tolerable. And how are we going to achieve that? I, I honestly have no idea. I mean, <laughs> scaling up right now is the only solution that's in the visible horizon. But you know, like maybe we can do better. Okay. Yeah, I love that. Um, great. Well, I would say let's open it up at this point. Um, do we have a microphone that we're going to pass around? How do you want to organize this? Okay, amazing. Oh, okay. Well, the people online can hear you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to, um, I don't know if you can share more about your data collection and curation process since you have such a small data set. And then you mentioned more data didn't lead to better results. Like, do you have intuition on why, why that was the case? Yeah, sure. I, I guess if you're asking about the Alpaca data, you know, the data is generated from uh, OpenAI's API language model, DaVinci 003. We did very little to no curation at all. I mean, we, we, we sorry. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we did little to non curation. I mean, the, the, we, the only thing we did was just remove duplicates data from there. Um, now, why do we not see any gain from you know training on more data? I, I think there's really a big unknown. Like, if we believe that you know this process is just teaching the model to format, you know, now you should answer your questions. Maybe it was ten thousand example that is more than enough, and you know training with more data. Well, not if it's not really telling you, uh, teaching you new knowledge, you're not really benefiting. So does that mean that the model has learned what it, everything that it could in terms of just the instruction tuning? Given that if you keep giving it more instructions, it's not learning anything new. So what I'm saying is, does that mean it has learned as much as it could? Is, is that? It could also be a diversity issue. So because we generated everything with, with, with Tex DaVinci as user three, um, it might be that at some point it's a little bit repetitive, and if we actually had 50,000 examples that are more diverse, then it would improve. So that's why I think we really don't quite know. All we know is that the current model, we're pretty confident it doesn't improve with that data. Um, I do think that generally we believe we could still do something by collecting more data. It might be different data. I think that's, that's our mindset. 
Cool. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Rocky. I'm the founder of AGI House. I host these kind of events a lot uh, more regularly. So actually, last night I was hosting Professor uh, uh, Trevor Daria. You know, he's a co-director, founding co-director of the Berkeley AI Lab. So one interesting takeaway is he's he believes in like the vision model, like the large language based uh, similar to the vision model is uh, possible and probably pretty close. I would love to hear, especially Rohan, you guys are in the vision and uh, what's the status and uh, how we can get there. Is this, is this on the horizon? I have another question. I would love to hear the first answer first. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. So, um, uh, yeah, so I think recently also we've lot, seen a lot of people sort of adding multimodal uh, image capabilities to existing language models like Llama. So, like, you know, OpenAI has, has their image based GPT 4, which they haven't released yet, but they, you know, showed in a demo. And ever since then, the open source community has been really trying to get this to work with Llama models and, you know, uh, making some adapters to make this work. So I think this is just a very, very initial early stages. Um, sort of the thing that's been doing, been happening right now is you sort of just train this adapter, uh, sort of this encoder on top of the language model that just fuses into it so that the model can reason about this image. Uh, but one of the really powerful things about the language model is that it's trained on all this text and it can just recall all of this text when it's generating an answer for you. And so this tuning process with the images is not the same because when it's generating a new answer for you, you can't just recall over all the stuff that's learned in the images. And how do we get that same qualitative feel about learning from this history of you know, billions and trillions of images that we fed into it? Uh, as we did with language, this is an open question and will likely require a lot of new architecture and engineering work in order to get this to happen. Um, and I think the next frontier that people have already started exploring you know, on top of this is a video-based understanding. Uh, and if you just think of videos, you know, it's, it's computationally, it's, it's a huge engineering challenge, right? Uh, whatever you did for with the images doesn't work anymore because it's not like you're going to embed every single frame of the video with your image-based pipeline. So I think, you know, how do we handle videos in a, in a, you know, in, in a computationally feasible way, train it? Uh, what are the time scales that you maybe want to feed in videos of minutes? Like that's a hugely complex thing to do at this moment. Yeah. We have simply no answer about, but this will really enable, I think, a lot of awesome creative applications. What's your guess? Let's say Tesla or YouTube, or Google, right? Do they train all the YouTube data, or Tesla train all their like the data that they collect from self-driving, <laughs> FSD? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think. I mean, I really have uh, no idea like how you know these companies would go about doing this, but uh, uh, yeah, I think you know really you would need significant computational resources. So this is not something that I think. Uh, you know, I think these small demos that we were seeing with this, like, uh, like image grounded llamas and stuff, like, you know, you know yeah, that, that, that many of those will happen, but these large scale projects will be very concentrated for sure. Yeah, I love the same question to the Professor, and he believes, like, uh, probably they didn't use the data in the right way yet. <laughs> so that's his answer. Uh, the second question is, like, the fact that GBT, uh, the GBT you mentioned that uh, we want something like a ground truth because that's very important. You want to be reliable. Actually, we host the Hackathon in New York. We have, like, a, the, the winners, like, a fact GBT. They're basically trying to check against, like, the uh, Wikipedia. Do you think there's some kind of research, or you personally, you guys, but really interesting to build a baseline, certain category of information that you can rely on, like a calculator? Because, yeah, that's my question. Yeah, I, th I think there are many exciting approaches like retrieval-based language models or, you know, to use, you know, browsing, search on the internet. Um, something I learned over the years of, like, factual audit research is that, you know, facts are hard to define. Like, a lot of facts require reasoning, right? Like, um, now I'm telling you I, I, I live in London. Does, does that make me an Englishman, you know, like? There, there, there are many, it's not a clear cut issues and, and there's a lot of common sense reasoning um, in this. So, you know, I don't have a great answer. I, th I think all of these hybrid approach, they will help. And whether we're, we're gonna solve this is a, is a separate discussion, yeah. Because uh, the presidential election is coming up, right? I think that's gonna be the pressing issue for, for last year's models, for the disinformation of the whole society. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, you know, it's hard to tell what is factual, but it's easy to generalize like, yeah. non-factual stuff right now. You know, this asymmetry is really uh, alarming, I think, yeah. Okay, hi. Um, so uh, I was actually uh, using the Laura weights in the uh, Alpaca Laura GitHub repo, and I noticed it was very interesting that the validation loss was decreasing, but then when I tried to... Uh, generate some samples it just started spitting out the explain instruct it just like took the instructions and started like spitting it out 
in wow. the output. So it was just weird seeing the validation loss plateau to something low, but then the output is really janky compared to the, I, I guess, what was it reflected in the validation loss. Um, any comments on what could be going wrong here? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, um, I, so this is, um, this is like a very technical question, and I, I think without giving like much further context, it's a little bit hard to pinpoint what exactly the problem is. Um, all of us are, you know, more than happy to help you out if you could post something, yeah. maybe afterwards. Okay. And you know, this is like a sorry, this is like a technical question that's hard to you know, exactly pinpoint on the spot. All right. And um, the next question is: I tested out like GPT for all, um, and a lot. It was just really interesting that okay, so you have this like really knowledgeable core language model, but you're, sup you're sup technically supposed to be able to do like sentiment classification by like putting in some in input and then some output like positive and negative, right? The output is positive and negative. But I, then I realized that all of these large language models, they don't work very well except for ChatGPT. So if you try to insert them into like some prompt management library, the only one that is really performing well enough on those like basic language model tasks like sentiment classification uh, named entity recognition is chat GPT. So I guess like what is the difference there for all the other language models to get to chat GPT level? So, so I just to make sure I understand did you say that GPT-4 was not as good? I, I tried GPT-4 all and oh, I guess okay. like my team was just trying to use prompt management library with something that was open sourced and so and I, like, I can probably yeah. chime in for the first half of the question um, the second one, half is like pretty broad and maybe we can all of us can share some ideas but um, so one of the specific things for alpaca was that we had a very specific input uh, and output prompt format um, so this is um, so just to give a bit more context so you know when you train a model you have your input and output but you would also maybe at times want to, you know, phrase your input or format your input in a specific way. Um, and um, there, there are sort of, um, you know, consequences of doing this. So when you format your input and output in specific ways, when you try to prompt it in different ways at test time, there's sort of a train test misalignment. So you might get sort of, um, you know, ill looking examples. Um, so very specifically, the prompt we had was like, um, here's an instruction, you know, respond in an appropriate way or something like that. But you know, this formatter might actually create issues when you try to prompt the model in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that I, I, I think, you know, at least I've talked to a lot of people about, and I, I think there are sort of, you know, known solutions if you just iterate uh, on this, um, uh, you know, in, for enough times. Yeah, so there's not some problem that we cannot solve. Yeah. Yeah, and for the, I guess for the question of how can open source models catch up with ChatGPT, I mean, clearly there's a lot to be done. I mean, I think Chen mentioned prompt diversity, data diversity, you know, task diversity. Uh, they also did obviously like, you know, multi-turn chat tuning. I think it's something, you know, the open model, we haven't really done very careful analysis for all the multi-turn behaviors. I mean, we, we do see that, you know, we really train Alpaca to perform well for single turn instruction following, and that at the same time kills a lot of the you know in context learning uh, ability. So not exactly sure how you are using the prompts for, but um, you know I, I think these we definitely lost a lot of in context you know prompting ability when, when we do this very aggressive instruction tuning right now. So how do we preserve that? Is is the next step? Yeah. Hi, uh, let's say um, you know, you're, you're a decent engineer, but you don't know uh, a lot of ML, and you want to be able to uh, build a system that uh, serves uh, LLM in production, uh, as well as does fine tuning, uh, and um, you know, basically, also you, you don't understand the stack, right? So what is an opinionated answer for how to design such a system in the shortest amount of time possible, like something that can almost fit in a weekend? <laughs> I'm happy to say we know exactly the opposite. <laughs> so I mean, we know, played with the Apaka demo when it first came yeah. out. Then <laughs> yeah, we know all the research stack and all of the engineering stacks. So, you know, I think we're not really the great people to answer that. Yeah. Uh, 
I think there's a lot of interest in getting solving exactly this problem. And so I think even we're already seeing a lot of solutions come out. Uh, and some of them are open source for like exactly how to do this hosted inference uh, and how ha handle all the load balancing, model batching, et cetera, serving. Um, so yeah, I personally wouldn't be able to say what solu particular solution is the best, but I think this is something that will get better very quickly within a few weeks. Uh, hi, yeah, this is also a somewhat practical question. Do you have any tips or advice for making LangChain give faster results? Because sometimes agents take a long time to respond. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know about LangChain specifically, but generally for prompts, what we found is that, so maybe for LangChain it might be complicated, but like one thing which we did to make it faster is, is batching. So you try to ask a lot of questions in one single prompt. So I'm not sure exactly what's your task, and maybe you cannot do that in, in LangChain. But for us, for example, for evaluation, uh, we are using GPT-4 for evaluating. That's way too slow, and it's also costly. So what we do is that we, we batch 10 examples, and we're like, OK, now evaluate all of this. And then you have to be a little bit careful about how do you design the prompts to make it clear for ChatGPT that it has to do 10 tasks at once. But if you're able to do that, it will be way quicker. So yeah, I don't know if that's possible in your case, but that's one way of doing it. So I guess I'm surprised I'm the first one asking about this. I'm sure a lot of folks have seen the, the Google memo about nobody really having a, uh, a moat in this space. Um, curious, this is obviously very speculative, but curious what your thoughts are on, you know, what are some scenarios that are likely to play out in, in terms of that, the you know, tension between sort of small, uh, fast, cheap models and these larger closed proprietary systems. Um, do you have any thoughts on what's likely to play out or, or even at the least, like what are the sort of dynamics that are likely to determine whether whether things go one way or another over the longer term? Yeah, I mean, we're not great business people. It's hard for us to uh, predict. Um, I do want to highlight, you know, really this whole wave of small open models that are all built on Llama, right? I mean, the pre-trained model is crucial and, you know, we cannot be mistaken if you're thinking that you really $600 all it takes. It does not. I mean, it's $4, $4 million to train uh, Llama 65V, you know. The price tags are there. Um, Pre-trained model will continue to be the most important role in this whole stack. And uh, whether, you know, an open source entity can have the ability to train these models, you know, can get enough funding to train these models. So it's a big unknown. But, you know, from our perspective, we'd love for that to happen, yeah. Yeah, and generally for the, I don't know how it will pan out, but I think we would be in a worse place if in five years we don't have like this open source community which catches up. So that's what we want to work on. Um, let's hope for the best and let's see how it pans out. Yeah, uh, interesting you mentioned John Schumann's talk because in his talk he also mentioned that distilling data uh, from GPT-3 or whatever GPT-4 or ChatGPT is going to create some instruction set that's out of, let's say, Llama's data distribution. And how would you, have you experimented try, uh, from just distilling the Lemma data directly? And second question is, I'm not sure how much you have like play around with LoRa, but when, in general, do you find that when we do LoRa training, uh, would it be beneficial to do the attention metrics only or attention plus the whole like fee four stack? Would that impact the performance or like the quality generated results? So I can chime in for the second part, but maybe others could uh, start the first part. Sure, I can. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really interesting argument in, in the talk. So the argument kind of is like uh, most of the knowledge in the model is learned in pre-training. In the instruction tuning phase, you know, if you try to teach it to answer a question it couldn't really answer, you're really teaching it to hallucinate, right? Like. Uh, you can't really force this behavior out of the model. I mean, to, I mean, it's really a research question. I think it's a very interesting hypothesis, but we need to be empirical about it, right? How do we even test this? I mean, I mean, I don't believe that after instruction tuning, we see more hallucinations simply because the preacher model couldn't really answer a lot of stuff. So it's hard to measure. Now, on the other hand, I mean, there are also inherent differences in learning from human feedback. One thing we see in our research is, you know, you need to sample two answers for human to judge which one is better. But a lot of the time, both samples are wrong, right? I mean, how do you, what do you want a human to do? You want to say all of them are wrong or say this is slightly better. I mean, it's possible when you say this is slightly better, you're still teaching it to be wrong, right? So there are these details. 
uh, that will matter for this. And um, yeah, nobody knows really, I think, right now. I think one thing I want to just chime in on quickly is that, uh, you know, so far, like a lot of the community has been viewing these as two separate stages. Like you have the pre-trained model, and then you tune it to respect the knowledge that's in the pre-training. Uh, you know, I don't know if like this is, this is a do certainly a dominant paradigm, but I don't know if this is the paradigm that will continue to last or one that, you know, maybe, maybe we should investigate a little bit more whether this should exist or not. Uh, can we teach it new facts in the fine tuning process? Generally, should there even be these two separate stages? Like should a lot of the, pre a lot of the instruction tuning come during the pre-training process as well? I think these are uh, sort of open questions. And so, um, yeah, I think, yeah, all, all this is open questions. So we don't really know. And, uh, but I think it'd be interesting to s figure out exactly what are the right mechanisms and is there a way that kind of we can merge these, these, two, uh, these two stages together? I think, yeah, that would be yeah. interesting. Um, I wonder if you guys have tried um, using Alpaca for the more financial applications in terms of trading. Because as a quant, um, I use a lot of machine learning models to do prediction or like for trading purposes. I wonder how can this new wave of like AI models and especially you guys models like help with making trading decisions? So the honest answer is that we did not try any, <laughs> uh, basically any application. Um, but I do think it's a, even from a research perspective, it's very interesting to know how can you take a model and you can specialize it for some basically vertical. I think it's not completely clear how to best do it. Like it's maybe if you just collect 10,000 data points for like finance, uh, it might be, it might help, but like we don't quite know uh, basically. And we haven't really played around with that. Yeah, I guess, you know, my sort of take is that uh, directly asking for like predictions about financial data might be a bit hard from just a raw language model, but what it can be really useful for is more like summarizing documents and overall sentiment that's happening on the internet and things like that. Then you can use that as signal for whatever further, you know, separate machine learning model or prediction pipeline that you have uh, down in the stack. So uh, I personally don't know anything about this world. So yeah, I would be uh, interested to learn more about how this sort of works. But, yeah. Okay, I think we have time for yep. probably a couple more questions. Uh, my question is, uh, do you see any limitations from the smaller sample size, the uh, model size, and uh, any try to even lower it further? So we definitely do see that larger model, after all, do perform better. Um, I think we are not actively working on, you know, making the model smaller because, you know, really we expect people on the more pre-training end to, 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 do, to do these, you know. Now, there are also exciting research on you know, low precision compression of these models. We're not really the experts on this, so I don't want to comment too much. Um, but I think a lot of this question, I mean, at least with Alpaca, we, before Alpaca, we used to think, you know, you really need hundreds of billion. And now the question becomes less clear. And I think we need more study and, uh, and research about, you know, there's no inherent rule about 20 billion is all you need or, or something like that. Hi. So uh, Jan, you, you mentioned working on uh, representation learning before um, and kind of using these representations, embeddings, whatever, as like inputs to test specific models. Uh, I wonder if you still see that as a relevant approach in the era of language models. Will people be learning these embeddings and fine tuning different smaller, you know, shallow models for certain tasks? Or do you see, like for example, sentiment analysis, NER, or do you see people just using language models for that? So I think representations are still really important. I mean, even like in large language models, people now use like these vector databases, uh, where essentially it's trying to fit a lot in representations such that then you can have the large language model that basically query uh, some past text that they have seen. Um, so I think that is one thing that will probably continue. Um, generally, I think representations are, give you the ability of compressing a lot. And I think what we just said is inference is really important. And once you have compressed representations, you could basically do inference much faster uh, than having a seven billion uh, uh, parameter model that has to do your, your, your predictions. So I really think that representations are gonna be crucial where you need to have inference on mobile or inference um, on basically small devices. Uh, I kind of changed my mindset in the last five months of whether everything is going to be representation learning, which is why I moved more towards this instruction following land and like large language models. Um, so I, I would now say 
Most of it will be these large models. But if you want to have fast inference, you're going to use representations. Mm -hmm. Anyone really want to squeeze in one last question? I think we can do it. Okay, go for it. <laughs> okay, so, um, so far we've seen models that do um, question and answers, but it's one way, right? So we ask the questions and the model answers, and you know, so that's what instruction tuning is. Um, what I was really curious about, and maybe it's already out there, so you can tell me if it is, um, is what about the other way where the more like so we ask the initial question but then they question back right so introspect and then clarify and uh, it's, it's so a more natural conversation versus just one-sided instructions is the difference there only in the instruction fine-tuning like could we change that like where you had more of a different structure different format and would that do it or it's way more complicated than that yeah, this is a great question. Uh, I think it's, we don't really know what the answer to this is, but you know, it's very clear, like if you play on a chat GPT or GPT-4, so a lot of times it will ask you, instead of just responding, it'll ask you like, hey, I don't have this detail. You want me to send an email to who should I address it to? And it'll ask you for more information. So I think, you know, this is for Alpaca, this is not something that was really that represented in the training data, in the fine tuning data. So it really doesn't do this at all. Like it doesn't, it just spits out whatever. Sometimes it just hallucinates the answer because it doesn't take this, uh, this step to clarify. Uh, so I think there, like the, the difference here is like there's just better, it's sort of this instruction tuning data that has examples where this has happened. And uh, you know, the, hum the human has said, no, you should really ask for clarification before you provide the response. Uh, so I think the better data would go really a large part of the ways there. Um, as to how much of this is in the pre-training, I'm not really sure that's sort of an open question, but I, I expect you could really get a lot of the ways there by having the correct sort of data in the fine tuning stage, yeah, in the instruction tuning stage. Maybe one thing I can add is that right now, how we train, for example, in Alpaca from this all HF pipeline, or like how most models are, are being trained, is really pairwise preferences after a single turn. So you ask a model something, and then you say directly, that is better than the other thing. But that really favors having a model answer something right now instead of, asking some clarification and then having an output in five turns. So once you start viewing it as reinforcement learning over time, over multiple steps, which reinforcement learning is all about this actually, then I, I think that will come naturally. Because if you look at the output after 10 turns, then it's actually better, the human would have preferred one clarification to get a better answer afterwards. So I, th I think right now in open source models, people don't really do that. I would be surprised if in ChatGPT they didn't do that, but yeah. Okay, that's great. Let's thank the team.